the White House, Washington, D.C., USA. The day, July 2nd, 1964. The occasion, signing into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We must not approach the observance and enforcement of this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. Its purpose is national, not regional. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. So tonight I urge every public official, every religious leader, every business and professional man, every working man, every housewife, I urge every American to join in this effort to bring justice and hope to all our people and to bring peace to our land. One year has passed. Where has it gone? What has and what has not been done during that year which held such great promise? Oh, I'm Joe Rao. One year has passed since we had the uh, President's Civil Rights Bill enacted into law. And a year ago, we had a program with uh, some of the same people who are here today. Today, we are here to take a look back at this one year of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and to look ahead at what may come in other areas for civil rights for all Americans. With me in are Roy Wilkins, Executive Secretary, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and the Chairman of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Mr. Leroy Collins, who is the Director of the Community Relations Service and a former Governor of Florida who was ahead of his time on civil rights there. And Sterling Tucker, the uh, Washington Director of the National Urban League in a very distinguished city citizen of this city of Washington where we are today. The first question, if I may ask it, it will be of you, Mr. Wilkins. When we were fighting for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you uh, testified on the need for fair treatment, and I'll never forget that testimony, and I'd like to read a sentence of it. It must be remembered that while we talk here today, while we talk last week, and while the Congress will be debating in the next weeks, Negro Americans throughout our country will be bruised in nearly every waking hour by differential treatment in or exclusion from public accommodations of every description. From the time they leave their homes in the morning, en route to school or to work, to shopping or to visiting, till they return home at night, humiliation stalks them. Do you feel, Mr. Wilkins, that the first year of the Civil Rights Act and of the public accommodations provision has change that situation on which you gave such eloquent testimony? I think certainly, um, Joe Rao, it, uh, it has alleviated much of it. Um, I would say especially in the areas where the uh, abrasiveness was most uh, felt. Uh, we had uh, compliance, as Governor Collins well knows, um, in unlikely places, Mississippi, Alabama, in South Carolina and parts of Louisiana, the so-called hardcore areas, they did have this. And while all vestiges of this sort of humiliation have not by any means vanished, I think certainly after one year of the Civil Rights Act, we can say that appreciable uh, relief has come to many uh, Negro American citizens. Well, Governor Collins, I was there in the White House uh, July 2nd, 1964, a year ago when the bill was signed by President Johnson. And I remember vividly his first act was to appoint you 
to run the Community Relations Service. How do you look back on the year and on the public accommodations enforcement? I was there that night, too, and was extremely proud. And uh, while I didn't have anything to do with the real effort that was made to create the climate and create the acceptance by the Congress of this law, I, I admire greatly th those of you who were and all of the others of you here on this program were. And I think that history is going to, to signify that the passage of this law uh, just a year ago is uh, really one of the great, great landmarks of progress in the development of human relations in this country. Now, the President asked me to uh, direct the Community Relations Service, which is an effort to voluntarily assist the communities in resolving disputes and disagreement and in urging and, and bringing about a climate of acceptance of this law and all of our laws in this country against discrimination. And I think the progress that the nation has made in the past year has been phenomenal, uh, Mr. Rao. Uh, I think uh, when we look back and see the difference now and a year ago, th that uh, any fair-minded person will have to admit that, that the progress has been tremendous. And actual tests that we've made and checks that we've made on, on compliance with this law indicate a high degree uh, of compliance. And of course, the exceptional case, uh, the, the case that involves a, a horrible reaction and action, is the one that is projected in the newspapers uh, and by the broadcast media in our free society. Uh, and so some people get the impression because they hear of the exceptional instance of resistance that that is normal, which is not the case. Uh, for example, down in Atlanta, Georgia, when the one restaurateur there, Mr. Maddox, uh, was making his little speech of defiance and closing his door against Negroes coming into his restaurant, there were hundreds of restaurants in Atlanta, right in the same community, uh, where the proprietors had their doors extended wide and, and with a hand of fellowship and, and friendship and welcoming uh, the patronage of Negroes along with all of our other American citizens. And, and there has been a fine acceptance. Now, I, I agree with Mr. Wilkins that we certainly can't uh, feel that we can rest on our laurels because there's so much more to be done. Uh, we must accept this as momentum to go on and do the full job. And that's what the nation, I think, is on the way to doing. Mr. Tucker, um, you uh, have had a great deal of experience with another part of the 64 law, the provision called Title VI where the uh, federal government's funds cannot go to anything, any program that discriminates or segregates. Mm -hmm. Has that worked? <clears throat> well, I think that perhaps um, um, in spite of the, the record of the public accommodations law, which is perhaps section, which is perhaps the most dramatic uh, change there is, I think in the long run, the real significance of the Civil Rights Act will be found in Title VI and the use of public funds. I think there are three reasons why this is especially important. One is, I think that the uh, title itself makes it a national bill. Well, it re relieves the regional character of it. It's not a bill for the South, because we found that in hospitals, and even in the North, for instance, they had uh, Negro beds at one point. And now this is all being re-examined re under Title VI. I think a second thing is that um, uh, while another title deals with public school desegregation, I think most desegregation is going to come under Title VI of the bill. Because we found, for instance, last week that in Maryland, a state as far east as Maryland, there were 17 school districts whose desegregation plans had never been approved. And now they know that before the school opens next fall, they've got to get these plans approved, you see, under this title. And uh, eight southern governors were in Washington just a few weeks ago to uh, seek uh, uh, delay in the enforcement of Title VI with reference to public school desegregation. And their congressional delegations wouldn't even see them because this has become the law of the land now. So I think that under Title VI really is where we're going to see some of the greatest change. Someone said to me recently uh, that a hospital in Mississippi perhaps is one of the most desegregated hospitals now in the country because of the enforcement of Title VI of, of this act. So I think in Title VI, now I think perhaps one weakness and uh, which also might be a strength is that this is mainly administrative action. Uh, and therefore, the question of the effectiveness of it will, de determine that will be determined by the degree of administrative, administrative determination and enforcement. Well, maybe, Governor Collins, do you have any uh, 
feeling about the degree of administrative determination and enforcement of title Yes, I surely do, and I would agree with Mr. Tucker that this really is a tremendously significant part of this whole law and that this will be proved uh, in the course of time. Because under this law, the federal government shows that it must practice what it preaches. And, and the oratory and, and the subscribing to the great goals and, and statements of ideals of this nation uh, mean a, a great deal. But here, the federal government is directly on the spot to practice it. And I was just as proud as I could be when I sat in a cabinet meeting not too long back and the issue was made there before the president and all the cabinet that in some of the federal departments uh, that there was discrimination and the president could not have made a stronger statement and he said at that time that uh, he expected this law to be applied in every federal agency uh, no matter where it was located uh, no matter how big or how small that the federal government was going to see to it that, that these principles were applied in its own house and he called upon every member of the cabinet and all the agencies subordinate to the cabinet and all other federal agencies, not only to comply, but to report to him regularly uh, the uh, accomplishment of that compliance. And I think this is tremendously significant. I think it is also, and I, I was thinking back, um, uh, Mr. Rao, do you remember not too long ago, 1957, 58, 59, when people said uh, you were crazy for suggesting that the federal government ought to cut off funds that are used in a discriminatory manner, and how uh, even President Kennedy, who was far out on this question uh, and who felt so strongly about it, President Kennedy had his uh, hesitancies over this. I remember a conference we had with him in January of 1961. And uh, he said, as uh, every good administrator says, well, he said, you put that on paper and, and let so-and-so see it, one of my advisors. Now it has become the most powerful part of this. I think probably our <laughs> leaders, our listeners, uh, might, might uh, like to know that about $10 billion, what we're talking about here, is a sum of about $10 billion, which is allocated by the federal government here in Washington to the various states for various activities. Uh, That's right. One of the best known ones is uh, school lunch program, but highways come under it in the operation of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, state employment agencies, research programs, grants to universities and colleges, and all sorts of funds come under it. And uh, perhaps people away from uh, America don't understand exactly what we're talking about when we say cut off federal funds. I well, think let me just ask this question because uh, so far we've all agreed on the tremendous progress that's been made. Now there have been some terrible things that have happened in the last year. The uh, deaths of, uh, pe of people who were helping Negroes in the South and some real bad events. Uh, do you have any thoughts of how these bad events tie into the general picture of the progress we have made under the uh, law. Governor Collins, I know you yes, have to face up to these. I'd like to lead off uh, with that and, and point out the fact that it's Selma when the whole nation had much to be ashamed of and when all those horrible things happened there. Nevertheless, they so shocked the conscience of the American people that uh, there was a broad, in this land, a determination to see that the discrimination that had been practiced by the individual states and communities in voting against the Negro, that, that the last vestiges of that were removed in this country. And out of this indignation and out of this resolve has come the new law, uh, which uh, makes uh, reasonably sure that in the future that, that the states, no state or, or no county or no community uh, will practice any such discrimination. So as horrible as these examples of, of violence uh, have been, uh, still uh, they have s served to stir the American people to demand uh, very important action and uh, that action has developed. I think that um, um, I guess it's maybe it's a sad fact, but I think it was almost inevitable that the kind of great social change that is necessary and that is coming is going to bring with it uh, some acts of violence. And uh, 
Perhaps amazing it is that uh, there have not been more, uh, especially in a democracy where the people have to take the lead, which means that all kinds of opinions find a platform and all kinds of yes. opinion find support. And when this happens, then uh, something happens. But I think, as Governor Collins has said, it's amazing how the, the great mass of a public opinion has been able to mobilize so quickly uh, around an issue so that this violence does not spread. In each case where violence has erupted, immediately there's been a, an amassing of public opinion and public effort, uh, which has at least uh, contained it uh, at this point. And I think this has been essential to continued progress, else there could have been real trouble. I, I certainly endorse that. I, I was thinking while you were talking, uh, Stuart Tucker, about how the opinion of some of the Africans have, ha has changed, uh, particularly with reference to what the government is doing about it. Now that they have had a chance to study this thing a little closer and to have word from their ambassadors here, uh, we're beginning to get some reactions in our agency well, the government of the United States is working at this problem. And I think the upheavals, even the unpleasant things that happen, and the outbreak of public opinion does demonstrate that the country, the people, and the government, certainly the government is, uh, has uh, taken the lead in this. And we're wrestling with it. We're not sweeping it under the rug. We're not pretending that it doesn't exist. Uh, I think this is a great gain. Uh, Mr. Ryle, there's one phase of this law we certainly must not pass by without referring to, and that's the Equal Opportunity and Employment title of this law. Now, now under this, of course, people are assured uh, the right to be judged on their merits in regard to private employment, and this is a very far-reaching <coughs> uh, provision. Now, this law doesn't go into effect, actually, until right now, uh, on a mandatory basis. Uh, but the first year, it applies to all businesses that employ a hundred or more people, and then that progressively goes down until it applies to all businesses that employ 25 or more. But the important thing, I think, uh, to note is that employers uh, on their own and voluntarily and, and anticipating and recognizing the mandate that's implicit in this law have already uh, set in motion the many plans and procedures under which they are actually complying with the law and have been before it became operated. And of course, a new agency has been created, which has just gone into operation, which will oversee and supervise the, the actual implementation of this law. And this is of tremendous importance because the Negro in our country has been uh, rather brutally discriminated in respect to many employment opportunities. And from now on, this nation is committed to the proposition that he shall be judged on his merits and be given the opportunity that all other citizens have. And I think this is terribly significant. And this Sterling, uh, Tucker, your National Urban League has always been most interested in the employment problem. Now that we are starting with our Fair Employment Practices National Law, how do you feel about it? Well, obviously this is a bread and butter issue and nothing can be more significant than that. Uh, in Washington, <coughs> In a week or two, there's going to be held a meeting of, of area employers who are going to be taking a look at this law. The Urban League is arranging this meeting to determine how can we work together, for instance, in this community to make this law work. So there is no talk of resistance. It's a question of how can we, you know, smooth the way so for this kind of implementation. I think this is going to be extremely important. The country has a lot of good, good experience. We have... Uh, some state uh, fair employment uh, laws now under which there's been good experience. We've had the President's Committee on Equal Employment Opportunities and uh, under these committees we've learned a great deal. We have a number of employers already in compliance who are doing things, uh, who are recruiting in places where they didn't recruit be before, who are training Negroes in jobs where they didn't train before. And so, we're, so what we're really going to do is take a good national experience that we have and give it greater breadth and greater depth. And I think that we're going to be in a good position to move ahead in this regard. I think one of the other aspects of this law that we haven't touched upon, and not, not this one, but the new law that went into effect, um, is voting. We've touched on school desegregation, employment, and public accommodation, but voting, of course, in a democracy is most important. Right. We read about 90% or 99% of this country voting, and, and uh, yet we know that 
in Selma, the, the Governor Collins mentioned Selma. The reason we had Selma was because in the state of Alabama, one half of the counties had less than 15% of their Negro so voting age registered to vote. And in Mississippi, this percentage went up to 76 out of 82 counties. Yes. Yeah. So that this new vi voting bill that's just going into effect uh, will remedy these hardcore, long-established uh, deprivations. And I look for great progress on the local level toward correcting some of the problems that now must engage national organizations or the federal government. I look for, as soon as we get voting, I look for problems with sheriffs and judges and, and uh, local elected officials to, uh, to uh, decline because they won't have those kind of sheriffs. Well, you know, Roy Wilkins, I recall uh, in your speech on the March on Washington on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963 on August 28th, when you said, as many congressmen sat in front of you, uh, that we want to get this Civil Rights Act passed because we're going to help free some of our Southern congressmen. Because you knew that their hearts were right and they wanted to vote right, but politically it would be suicidal to vote their convictions. And I said to someone, and uh, speaking in the USIA uh, uh, lecture here recently, uh, they asked, well, what will happen to many Southern congressmen uh, when the Negro gets and uses wisely the right to vote? And I says, well, I expect some of these congressmen to become some of the greatest liberals in the United <laughs> States Senate and House of Representatives, because I think that they would like to vote and their some convictions. Some of them will retire. Yeah, and some <laughs> of them will retire, this is perhaps as it should be. But I do think that this, the voting rights section cannot be uh, overemphasized yeah. because herein is really the heart and the guts of a democracy. Right. And well, so I was kind trying of to say about that uh, a few uh, words connected with last time's program. A year ago when we were on this program together, uh, all of us except Governor Collins, who we're so glad to have today, we pointed out that the voting rights section of the 64 law was not adequate. Yes. And what happened was that <laughs> here we are just a year later while the other provisions of that law has worked, and now we are about in to start on a new crusade on the voting rights provision. And I remind you all that the voting rights bill not only provides a machinery for the federal government to register the Southern Negroes, but it outlaws the literacy tests and other devices that have been used against the uh, Negro voting. So I think uh, one can say for the voting rights law, just now going into effect, that it is the real answer on the voting. But now, gentlemen, what is it really going to mean when in Mississippi, a, over 40% of the population are Negroes in vote in Alabama, uh, it goes up not quite that high, but almost as high. Now, what is it going to mean when all the Negroes vote in the same proportion as whites in these areas where our difficulty has been had? I think you're gonna get good men. I don't think it's going to mean a, a Negro takeover. In fact, no one has had that experience thus far. You're going to get some Negro candidates elected who were already good candidate material beforehand. And you're going to have, as uh, Sterling Tucker has suggested, you're going to have a continuance of Southern congressmen. You're going to have some Southern mayors reelected because they're good men and they can run the government and the Negro voters know that they're good men, and they're all Southerners together, they certainly wouldn't be voting against them because they're Southerners. <laughs> yeah. How does it look to you, Governor Collins? You had to run in a state where Negroes, while well, some voted, some didn't. How would it affect the situation in, say, Florida, where you were a governor ahead of his times? Well, I think in our state, we've seen the last of anybody making a statewide campaign on a racial issue. Yes. or appealing to racial prejudice. I think, the, and the reason for that, the big reason for it, is not only this law and the influence of this law, but specifically the fact that we have a Negro voter registration to a point now that it would be almost suicidal for a candidate to think in terms of just canceling out a, a vote yes. that strong. And that's the reason it's so important that that vote be that strong. Yes. Yes. And the, the present governor who's serving in our state uh, was not regarded uh, as especially liberal in this area when he was elected, but even so, he has made it a point already 
realizing uh, this basic fact of political life in our state, he's made it a point to, to do certain things that no other governor has ever been willing to do in our state. So this is real progress. And I don't think in the South we're going to have uh, uh, many elections, and in many places in the South we'll never have another election in which there will be an open issue of antagonism against the Negroes expressed. I think it's well to note that Governor Collins' estate had one of the highest percentages of Negro registration, yes. on second only to Texas. Yes, yes. that's right. And I think important to all of this will be the wisdom that the Negro uses in the exercise of the ballot. And I think many organizations, uh, such as the one Roy Wilkins heads, the NAACP and the Urban League and other groups, uh, for instance, in the last uh, national election, uh, put on a, 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 a very important campaign across the country to raise the uh, participation of Negro voters everywhere. And I think that the, uh, this participation nationally of the Negro in the past elections will serve the future well in terms of his broader participation in political affairs, both North and South and East and West. Gentlemen, it's going to be hard for you to believe this, but our time is up. Uh, it's been such an interesting uh, program that it went uh, terribly fast, but now not only our time is up, but the year is up. The year in which we uh, had to decide whether we could make the 1964 law work. And I think it's our feeling that despite the blemishes on the record of the last year, despite the difficulties, they were difficulties that came out of progress, out of things moving forward, and that what we told you a year ago about our great new civil rights law of 1964 was not an exaggeration. It's even worked, I believe, a little better than even those of us who were in it could have hoped for. And now with a new law in voting rights, I think we can say to you that we feel that that law, too, is going to help move this country towards where we want to be, that all men are created equal.